Bună dimineața! Sper că nu este o problemă că vom vorbi în limba engleză. E vreo problemă pentru cineva? <laughs> ok, so good morning everyone! Uh, thank you very much for being here. Like George said, it's a miracle that anyone came on a Sunday morning. Um, you have to forgive me because I'm very um, nervous. I've never done this before and also I'm sitting uh, next to three of my favorite musicians. So I'm very um, excited and honored. <laughs> um, this marks the day of um, the, the beginning of the last day of Sonic Gardens. Uh, George is going to uh, play for us an amazing program at five o'clock in this uh, very hall. And uh, there is another um, uh, show, uh, Surrealist Garden at uh, 7.30 in the Opera and Media Hall. And we urge you to come and uh, see both these events. Um, first of all, I'm going to start with a boring maybe question, and I'm going to, uh, because this is a festival that is created by ISCM Romania, so the national section of ISCM, and I want to ask George, because he is a member of the board of ISCM, what is ISCM and why do we need it? Ah, that was a simple question. Um, well, the ISCM is, as many of us in this room know, uh, it, it's a network with about 60 different countries involved in it. Uh, it was started 98 years ago in Salzburg, so it's the oldest sort of uh, society of its kind. And, you know, in the 20s, 22, 23, they had, they had lots of premieres of Stravinsky and Bartok, and, because that was that time's new music. Um, uh, now, I think the most important thing about ISCM, it meets every year, it has a, a big festival, and then during the festival, uh, the people from each of these different countries meet and talk about music and about their situations. Uh, and I think maybe the most important thing about ISCM now, aside from the concerts, which are always the most important part, uh, is that it gives us a chance to meet people from, you know, Vietnam, you know, and ask them about their situation. And we can learn something about their situation. And, they can ask us about what's going on in Sweden. And, you know, Europe can meet North America and South America. Because I think the most important thing for the future for new music, aside from the, the good music, is that we have to find strategies to keep on surviving. And the best way to do that is to have a society with lots of different people that talk and try and figure out ways to, 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 keep, uh, to keep music going. Um, I have to ask Mrs. Diana Mosh, first of all, thank you, because uh, the National University of Music is an amazing partner all the time for new music festivals. It's probably the, uh, the most active and uh, uh, supporting organization for new music. Um, I have to ask you because uh, this year uh, we had, um, like George can also tell us about it, uh, this project called a collaborative series and uh, you had a great recital on Thursday and you played one of the pieces that we selected. Um, what, uh, how did you approach it? How, how do you view this um, idea of um, playing music and discovering music through this kind of selections? Uh, first of all, I think it's uh, normal that uh, the National University of Music uh, supports such a sort of events. If uh, not, uh, who could uh, support this kind of... Uh, so it's perfectly normal. It's nothing uh, exceptional. Uh, and um, for uh, this specific question, uh, it's a challenge for me, and it was, uh, uh, to discover something new and uh, well, uh, selected uh, works by the others, why not? I'm very open and uh, in this way I have the opportunity to know something new and uh, very fascinating uh, very often. 
I, I just want to say something very quickly. You, you say it's normal. It's actually not normal in most of the world for universities to support new music yeah. in that way. So you should be very, uh, very proud and very. I'm very happy that you do that to see enough. You know, in our tradition, yes. it's normal. And, yes, yes, yes. And uh, keep that it's, normal. Normal. it's normal for you. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. and. Uh, as a continuity, because uh, uh, Dan De Lu yeah. was the former uh, former uh, rector yeah. for uh, eight years before, yeah. so uh, yes. I for us it was normal in yes. order to. But, but to in, help the, in the whole, this is one another thing about ICM. We learn about the way things are in the world, and 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 this is a very good example. Then, so you, so you're doing very well. Is what I'm saying. So I hope for a wider normality. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, speaking of. Uh, this uh, thing, uh, Mr. Dan Dedu uh, was for many years rector of the university and now he's um, artistic director of um, the May Festival, the International New Music Week. Uh, Mrs. Diana Moore, she's a very active performer in the profile ensemble and as a soloist and in different chamber situations. And uh, George uh, is, and I quote, one of the rotor blades of Swedish new music because he's organizing a lot of things. Uh, I would like um, for you to, to tell us exactly what you do. And a question for all three of you, how is it um, like to be a bit of a do-it-yourself uh, do artist? So to, to create music, to uh, create performances, but also to organize, to be your own PR, uh, and also to be a teacher because all three of you are teachers, so you, you, have, you are Renaissance uh, personalities. <laughs> mm, how it is? I mean, number one, I don't think it's a choice. I think you just wake up every morning and do what you have to do. Uh, I have a little trouble answering your question because one of the things about my life is that, you know, the day after I do something, I forget I did it and because I'm doing the next thing. And so I can't tell you exactly what I'm doing at this time. Uh, I mean, I know what I'm doing today and tomorrow, but yesterday I, I totally forgot. Uh, but it's usually a bunch of emails and it's usually a bunch of projects that are going on at the same time. Uh, there's a festival in Stockholm in two weeks, we're putting the final touches on that. Um, uh, and you know, I, I, I tend to like to practice the violin every day, so I do that every day. Uh, and then, uh, you know, it's, 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 all, it's all the same thing though, you know, I think uh, having to do everything yourself also gives you control over the result. And that's uh, a very important thing that we shouldn't forget because uh, the times that I've had larger institutions asking me to do things, it's never really turned out the way I wanted it to turn out because you have to do things in a different way than you wanted to do it yourself. So, yes, there's less money and there's a lot more work, but at least you know what's going to happen. You have some sort of control over the, and, and that's pretty important for me. Well, I have to recognize that uh, for me, it was quite uh, a relaxing, relaxing uh, life from organizatory point of view uh, since uh, a few years ago. <laughs> Because as a performer, performer in a profile uh, ensemble, my job was uh, to perform and uh, all the other things were in uh, the job of the director, of the <laughs> artistic director. Uh, of course, uh, it was a great change uh, because uh, in uh, such uh, a position as a rector, I had uh, to deal with a uh, lot of things, and uh, organization is in uh, first place. Uh, it's not easy to do music, because uh, the most uh, of the time you have to do a lot of other things, completely different, so I uh, really uh, work hard to do music, and uh, I consider that is a privilege to do that. So I, uh, I try to uh, touch the violin, <laughs> uh, if not every day, uh, at least uh, uh, for the, every occasion I have to, to play. And I'm uh, really grateful that I have such occasions. So uh, it's really a privilege to do music. <laughs> I, uh, I realize only now.
<laughs> I'm doing a lot of things. <laughs> Uh, but I enjoy the most driving <laughs> and uh, on the second place I, I enjoy composing. Uh, you know, there is an interview of Stravinsky uh, who declares I love composing with this accent. I love composing even more than I like music. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> you get accustomed with all uh, this uh, stuff. And uh, organization, administration, it's a sort of uh, challenge. And uh, it gives you the opportunity to make things for other people in order to uh, assure uh, new audiences to help people to get involved with music. And I think if uh, you love music and you enjoy making music, you are obliged in order to organize your environment uh, in order for other people the newcomers to have something to, to react to and uh, of course uh, for them to have also a challenge for their future and uh, this is I think is important and uh, we all of us I think we uh, we done uh, we do uh, many things because we cannot otherwise and uh, for creating this uh, positive environment and helping new people to come in the uh, domain of uh, new music to get accustomed with new sonorities with uh, different perspectives of thinking about music and so on so i think uh, we have to do otherwise uh, there are a lot of other people who don't give a damn on your music. <laughs> so we, we have to... Yes, and, and I think to create a friendly climate yes. for everything uh, to happen. I think it's very, very important. And uh, uh, as far as you have a, a very good team, with uh, brilliant, uh, brilliant uh, members, uh, this is the most important thing. And uh, I was blessed with such a team, so uh, <laughs> I was uh, really lucky, I think. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of, some, I mean, okay, composing is one thing. I think when you compose, you should not actually think about uh, anything else but what you want to have in the piece. But after that, uh, the administration and the, the, all the applications and the actual playing of the concerts, they all have the same goal. Uh, and it's, it's putting the audience in the best position to succeed. You know, and that's like making a friendly atmosphere. You can do that at the administrative level by getting a venue that will work. You know, and, and the, the PR that will make people feel welcome. And then we as musicians can do that by reading the room and saying, okay, you know, how, how, do, I, how do I approach these people so that they feel like you know, they're part of this, and not just someone who's supposed to stay on the on the outside and listen. And and this is so. In, in that way, it's the same thing from administration up to playing in concerts. It's, it's, we're just trying to get give people a chance. Um, uh, I wanted to mention all the cool things that George does in this direction because you have a uh, let's say non-traditional approach to creating. Um, a friendly environment for the music, uh, and um, maybe you can tell us about set, okay. about um, the first before swine experience. I have to, uh, here to make a short break and to say if um, to tell you that uh, if you want to blame someone uh, for the fact that I'm writing music, uh, it's George <laughs> indirectly because I remember I was uh, very young and I uh, was about to. 
I entered the conservatory and I was very unsure of this world that seemed fascinating but maybe a bit too pretentious, to be frank, and uh, I didn't know I wanted to enter it and I found a um, CD with a pig on it and uh, I listened to it and it was this amazing ensemble that uh, George is leading. Uh, is, uh, uh, how do you say in Swedish? Uh, the pearls before swine experience. The pearls before swine experience. Um, and uh, George, uh, I want George to tell you about uh, what, uh, how they work with composers and how you commission works for them. And also uh, about the elevator project. Um, and yeah, all this uh, uh, very, uh, not only friendly, but very warm and uh, very uh, comfortable situations that you create for the music. Okay, uh, and uh, I'm really pleased actually you became a composer uh, because you write good stuff. Uh, okay, let's put it this way: what I, what I did is, is was not normal then, but now I think it's getting more and more normal. Uh, so in 1994, this is a long time ago, uh, I realized that I didn't like going to concerts, and I was thinking, okay, if I don't like going to concerts, and I'm a musician that there's something wrong. So I started thinking about what kind of concert would I want to go to? And I thought, okay, maybe a concert where uh, there were shorter pieces, so you get a lot of different pieces in the same concert, uh, and then also that you could have a break between each piece. So it wouldn't be, one of the things that I hated back then, and still do actually, is when a piece begins a concert and you don't know if it's gonna take five minutes or 45 minutes. Because you, you feel, you know, stuck, you have no idea. What if this is three quarters of an hour? I, I don't know. So, so knowing how long the piece is, I thought, was a, was a very important thing to know before you start listening to the piece. Because then you can sort of, you know, set your, set your brain for that. And so we started commissioning five-minute pieces by a bunch of different composers for flute, cello, violin, and piano. Uh, and the reason we did that was because then you could have a concert form that looked more like uh, other kinds of concerts than new music concerts, and that made people relax. So, we did that uh, for about 20 years, uh, and we're still doing things occasionally, but we try to do more like projects now and not just play concerts all the time. Um, for the same reason, I started this club sect uh, in, two th in 1999, uh, we realized there was no place for people who were like us to, to, to hang out. So we asked this, this jazz palace in Stockholm if they could just let us have Mondays. Uh, and so for seven years we had a club every Monday with a very short thing, there's that word again, short, but we had the um, performance and short film and then a short music act of about 20 minutes uh, every Monday. And, and that allowed People who liked film went there to see the experimental film. People who liked uh, performance went there to see the performance. And people who liked music went there to hear the music. And then they realized it was all the same thing. So they got to meet each other. These people, you know, people who liked poetry never went to music concerts in Stockholm. You know, it was just like one of those things that they thought, no, it's not for me. But this allowed us to sort of create this alternative audience that was three times as big all of a sudden because you had, uh, and, and again, like we were talking about before, the whole idea was getting a friendly atmosphere. With the swine, it was getting a nice concert form so people could relax, we could talk to the audience. And with this club, it was giving people a couple of hours to talk before and then an hour of things happening and then a couple of hours to talk about it afterwards. To make it more fun, more of a social event, except for when you're actually listening to the music. Also, Mr. David, because you also you chose a specific format for the May festival. Maybe you can uh, also in this idea of creating very specific worlds and to make people uh, be very interested in what kind of music uh, that structures are. Um, yes, and you have done also uh, with this idea of Sony Gardens for May festival, which uh, I think. Uh, uh, now has a, uh, a very specific profile. 
and uh, <coughs> I think it's very promising. Uh, 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 interesting to keep it also for the future. I don't know if in the same format or uh, <coughs> maybe in the same way of uh, having a theme of the whole festival and putting the whole uh, uh, amount of music uh, in that uh, format. In the other festival, uh, yes, I have uh, I had this idea of uh, utopias, the four utopias, um, and I gave, you know, all of them, uh, the names, uh, Gulliver, uh, uh, Matrix, uh, um, uh, Ulysses, and uh, do I remember the other one? Nirvana. Nirvana, yes. And uh, within these uh, categories, uh, I managed to uh, have some concerts, five concerts each category, and uh, to diversify the spectrum of uh, music uh, within this uh, format. And of course, uh, <coughs> we have to deal with many other uh, perspectives because uh, you know, all know these festivals are international festivals. We have to have a certain amount of music, which is not Romanian. And, uh, but, uh, in the same time, uh, we have a lot of Romanian composers who are struggling in order to compose pieces and to have these pieces performed within these frames. So we have many perspectives and we have to deal with uh, this. And of course, this is only, let's say, uh, um, uh, some ideas of uh, designing the program, but uh, the main problems are the financial problems. And uh, we have to interconnect this because if we have uh, some good uh, form of ideas which attract uh, the audience and which has some impact on uh, society, then uh, it is uh, easier in order to find uh, financing and to uh, get some money for this, to perpetuate this uh, kind of uh, festivals, we say. Yeah. But I think we managed to have the help of uh, important institutions, as you remarked here. The Union of Composers, on the one side, who initi initiated this, and uh, the ICM, Romanian section, the University of Music, which is not normal, but for us <laughs> it's uh, very normal because we are involved in this uh, new music scene. Um, uh, the radio, which uh, is also a very helpful uh, institution, and some other foundations or uh, institutions who uh, really appreciate our effort and uh, involvement. I'm not going to let you get away with, uh, without uh, talking about the elevator, elevator <laughs> project, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, uh, this is just one thing I did. Uh, um, we all know about elevator music and, and, and so this was I think 2008, right? 2000, something like that. Uh, it was a long time ago. Uh, um, so, for this festival in Stockholm, we wanted to do something that was a little special, so I thought we could do something about elevator music, but when you think about elevator music, you think that, yeah, yeah it will be like music in an elevator. Uh, but we decided, we, we thought it would be more fun to make it the other way around. So, so uh, we had the audience in the elevator, and, and uh, our quartet was spread out on four different floors of the, of the cultural house in Stockholm. Uh, and so, 
And then Matthias, actually, uh, my, my friend, uh, who you'll hear a little later on, uh, uh, was the um, elevator boy. Uh, and so we had a, a, a guy write a piece of music that was in blocks, Lars Carlson, and uh, the whole point of the piece was that there were 12 people in the elevator, <coughs> and the elevator would move up, and the doors would open, and then all four of us would be playing, and then the elevator would move up again, and then two of us would be playing, and then it would move down, and maybe one of us would be playing, and then it would move up again, and maybe three of us would be playing. And the piece went on for about 12 minutes, and we had to run up and down the stairs according to this special scheme to make it all work out. And, and the elevator boy had to press the right buttons on the elevator, you know, because otherwise it would be terrible. Uh, and and uh, this was like, it's sort of like, for two hours we had to do this. It was a 10 minute piece, and we did it I think uh, 12 times, uh, and uh, so 120 people got to got to hear this, you know, 10 people at a time, um, and uh, it's something that, you know, only 120 people heard it, but they will remember it their whole lives. You know, it's one of those things that, and and that's sort of why we want to make concerts, right? Uh, there should be like the 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 possibility that someone will never forget it. I wanted to ask you, after um, all these kind of projects, like the Elevator project, uh, which I love, and uh, your uh, idea with the sect and uh, the short um, bills of music of five minutes for the swines, um, do, uh, do you like going to normal concerts now? Or did I've did, always did liked, it change the perspective I've on them? I've always liked going to normal concerts, except for when I started. I, I mean, uh, I've always liked the music, I haven't liked the concerts, let's put it that way. Uh, but uh, I think the last 20 years, two things have happened that, that have made concerts, regular concerts, more fun for me. Uh, the first thing is that uh, at least I know there's an alternative now, so I don't feel like it's the only thing happening. So I, I have a good time going to a normal, little bit too long, regular concert. I, I think that's fine, because I know there's other stuff going on. And the other thing is the fact that I'm not the only one doing this anymore. You know, it's, 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 it's becoming more normal for people to think about uh, ways of making concerts uh, more interesting. However, one of the things that, that, that I still think is very important is that you can do whatever you want as long as you're not bothering the actual pieces. Uh, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of people who want, you know, blinking lights and, you know, Twitter corners during concerts and stuff like this. And, and that's a fun idea, but it has nothing to do with, like, that's not why we want to make concerts fun. We want to make concerts fun so that you can get those 15, 20 minutes of just sitting and listening to a piece and feeling good while you're doing it. Uh, I'm going to make a short music break and I want to start with the lady. So if you don't mind, I'm going to play um, a piece that I like very much. Uh, and then I'm going to ask Mrs. Morton some questions.
Yes, publishing with the university, but I, I think it is an uh, individual, uh, it's not right. Project it's but it's from now. someone who started from yes. someone yes. who's working yes. in the radio, yeah. and the idea uh, is that uh, they made an online platform with uh, video clips of new music, like this one, and uh, it was filmed uh, in uh, here, I think. Yes, in George uh, and George and Esco Hall. Uh, and it's online, so coolsound.ro. Then you can find also uh, information about composers and performers. Uh, so I wanted to ask uh, Mrs. Mosh, um, how do you approach a score like this compared to um, a classical score? Is, is there a difference? Well, for me, it is no difference. My approach is the same. I consider is this music and only music. So <laughs> if I uh, uh, start to study a piece for Bach, for example, well, uh, I, I begin with uh, the aesthetic uh, of the music and uh, well, I, uh, I uh, try to get the technical means to do, to do, to do that. And I think it's uh, the same process for every type of music. And uh, by the way, I think this uh, this piece is a very good example because uh, Mihai Manichanu um, um, used uh, a series of um, fragments from the most iconic uh, work in Romanian music. Uh, I refer to the third sonata for uh, piano and uh, violin by George Enescu. So uh, he used many elements from there. Of course, very stylized and uh, very processed, but uh, the background is there. And uh, it's uh, a sample uh, about uh, how the tradition, the element of traditions are integrated in uh, actual art. Uh, so uh, I was amused because uh, he assumed uh, some quotation, but the others he was not so uh, conscious about, and uh, I remarked, but you know, this is uh, also, oh, I didn't realize, uh, he told to me. Uh, but of course, it's a huge difference because the, between uh, the third sonata and uh, this product, final product. But uh, we all are uh, uh, are living in a in a cultural uh, tradition, even we don't uh, realize that. But it's very interesting this process of integration. And uh, well, uh, I love uh, this piece, and it was uh, my pleasure to do it. And uh, well, I uh, worked me with Bihai. Uh, but uh, well, well, to answer to your question. I think the approach is the same. It's now important in which epoch is uh, a work composed. The process of uh, performing is the same. I, I would agree uh, with, with the caveat that, that, uh, that, that the, the only real difference is that um, if it's a newly written piece, you haven't heard it yet. And so, but, but which is not, which which is sometimes good and sometimes bad. Uh, I mean, you know, we're two composers and two violinists here, so we know that you know you use the same 
techniques that people have always used to, to write music. It's not, it's, it's not, you know, rocket science. But um, when you play a piece that you've already heard in another version by someone else, then you have to work on those biases that you already have and don't know that you have. And, and uh, you don't have to worry about that when you when you have a piece that no one's ever heard before. You can just look at it and make your own decisions. Whereas you have to make decisions in another context when it's a piece that's been played before. Even if it's a piece of new music that's been played before, you still have to sort of look at it and, and, and take an attitude towards that tradition. Uh, interpretation, you know, people, people talk a lot about, uh, you know, it's this mystical thing, interpretation. Uh, they, oh, he's such a great interpreter, she's such a great interpreter, they're great. It's actually, you know, um, interpretation is basically just working on the piece until you find something you like, and then you can play it. It's it's not it's not saying now I'm going to interpret this piece. What you're doing is you're gonna you work on it, and they say, hey, no, this is pretty good now, and then 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 you've interpreted it. That's basically it. Also, uh, maybe I have to add that uh, for a new music piece, uh, the performer has more responsibility because people haven't heard the piece before yeah. and so you're practically creating it uh, but, but I would say, and this, is, this is the thing that I, I think is so strange it's much easier to listen to new music than older music because new music is what it is you know, if it's, if it's, if it's written today you get to hear it and that's what the piece is if you're going to hear a piece by Brahms or by Beethoven you have to know everybody who wrote at the same time you have to know the context where they wrote the piece you have to know the musical history behind it, it's a lot more work. You know, it's not just a bunch of tonal, uh, you know, it's not, it's not just a bunch of melodies, you know, which, which is what some people would have us believe. But to really hear a Beethoven symphony there, it's, you know, it's new music, uh, but you have to know what everyone else was doing at the same time. Whereas if, if it's new music, you just play it. Also, like you said many times before, uh, classical music was at some point new music. Of course it was. <laughs> It didn't, um, it didn't start off by being this old stuff. <laughs> um, so, okay, um, you mentioned uh, this thing uh, that Mihai Manichalo, by the way, uh, I think we all know, but George doesn't know, he's a very good uh, pianist as well, so he's writing music with also the experience of the performer, which yeah. is, I think, very cool. Um, so you said about uh, his uh, use of traditional elements, and this brings me to uh, my uh, next question for you too, because um, George, you have done a lot of projects where you update um, classical music. You have done. You are in a duo that who, uh, that is called There Are No More Four Seasons, and uh, this duo started with Matthias Peterson, who does electronics. He's also amazing. Um, you have updated uh, Vivaldi for the uh, 21st century, and now yeah. you are you are doing uh, you are in the middle of a project uh, with Beethoven, updating Beethoven with the pros before the spine, yeah. experience. Maybe you can uh, well, tell us what about this project. Is. They're somewhat different, but but the, the um, what I do with Matthias is uh, we've done four pieces now. We've done. Uh, the Four Seasons, and we've done Bieber's Pasacalia for solo violin, and we've done uh, Bolero, and we've done uh, Strauss waltzes. Uh, and the reason we've done those things is, is because, um, well, a little bit like I said before, because uh, these pieces are very good pieces, but I think most of the world has forgotten how to listen to them as if they were new music. I think musicians have an easier time listening to older pieces as if they were new music, because that's what we've always done. We, we, we try and make it you know, as alive as possible. So uh, one of the things we tried to do was make believe that the composer were alive today and wrote the piece. It's not like an arrangement. It's mostly a way of saying if Vivaldi was going to write about the Four Seasons today, he would obviously talk about environmental damage and pollution and, and global warming, and he would put that into the piece. And that would give us license to, 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 to use sounds that weren't necessarily uh, part of it from the beginning. Uh, that's why we do that. Uh, I, I think 
basically the same thing would be with the, with the Beethoven project. It's, it, it's, it's a way of making it, you know, the more important something is for me, the more I want to ask questions about it. I, I don't, uh, I don't want to just say that it's great uh, because that's boring and, and, and it doesn't really show how much I, how important I think these things are. So, uh, because I really like this music, I have to ask questions about what are we actually hearing when we hear these pieces. And I want people to go back to the original and listen to them as if they were new music after they've heard these other versions, basically. Also, uh, the Better One project started from an arrangement. Uh, yeah, it, it, yeah. Hummel has arranged all of the Beethoven symphonies for our setting, which is flute, violin, cello, piano. So what we did was we sent uh, this score, the Hummel score, to different sound artists and to different composers and asked them to, to, to do something with it. They could do whatever they wanted. They could add electronics, they could add pictures, they could uh, take away notes, they could repeat. They just couldn't write new notes. And then... Uh, we found out what they did in a bunch of different projects. We're still sort of working on it. It's uh, one of those things where some projects take about 10 years because of, uh, I don't know, money. <laughs> but uh, we're, still, we're still in the middle of it. We've got four, four symphonies now and uh, a couple more, I hope, coming soon. And uh, Mr. Lin, you, uh, you also use a lot in your works. Uh, we have a bit of a technical problem because I wanted to play something, so I'm just going to ask you first and then I'm going to play. Um, you're using a lot of your works, um, elements from uh, uh, tonal music, from classical music. It's okay now? Okay. Um, for example, uh, not only forms uh, and patterns, but also um, actual music, so quotations, distorted or not. Um, and we are going to play also at some point a fragment from Wagner Under. What is your attitude towards um, this music? Why do you feel the need to uh, incorporate in your language? It's uh, a long story. <laughs> uh, there are many uh, there are many approaches. Uh, for me, uh, sometimes I'm, I get obsessed with some uh, musics and uh, this means that uh, I really am intrigued by the quality I feel in some musics. So I want to know more, like George said already. So, I like to uh, get the, maybe the mechanism uh, within this music and uh, to understand uh, much uh, more of them. Uh, and there is also a, a kind of vibration I feel in some music. So, um, I want to incorporate that vibration. The music is magic. Uh, I, I, I hear sometimes in, uh, in some music. Maybe it's intriguing, but this is like this. It's not a quotation. It's not working with some notes. It's uh, working with a sort of energy that uh, could be expressed in that notes. And uh, my uh, perspective and my, uh, uh, my thought is uh, uh, like uh, the cryptomnesic. Uh, crypt cryptomnesi is uh, something that you have heard sometime you forgot that you have uh, uh, heard it and after 10 years or more you reinvent something you know you you think it's yours but you you reinvent that thing but in your own way so this is a story that why i i wanted to explain a little bit much more and with Wagner under happened like this a sort of internalization of the energy 
and then the externalization of the uh, same uh, energy that could be done with Wagner language, but like a quotation, but also with some filtered uh, new music language that is based on the Wagner idiom. It's a little bit uh, tricky, but uh, it's a sort of what, uh, what maybe the writers are doing. Writers like Kundera, like Samar Rushdi, like uh, even Murakami. And plays. Yes. Yeah, there's so many Shakespeare plays where they put everything into a new context and they change. Yes, yes. So it's a sort of putting uh, in another context the same energy. And uh, this is. You know, um, I, I think uh, now uh, you mentioned that. Uh, it uh, is perhaps uh, nowadays more difficult to play the music uh, from other times. But in the same time, I think before, there were uh, a number, a limited number of general frames. Uh, in music today, we have to deal with so many frames. And I think it's a trend that each uh, composer uh, tries to create his own frame. And I think this is the difficulty to uh, to to try to uh, to touch the specific of this frame. Mm. So uh, in this way, uh, the communication it's not uh, automatically done. Uh, by Sorry. the way, uh, the music today. Yeah. So uh, it is a sort of uh, inconvenient in. Yeah. <laughs> but, that, but that's why we have to work on them, exactly. If, if, if uh, I mean, we don't want to play a piece uh, that we don't understand, but that we have no idea why we're playing it. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep on practicing until you have some idea why you want to do it, because otherwise, <coughs> you're just standing there, it's really, it's a terrible feeling. You know, uh, it happened to me a few times 20 years ago, and I was like, I'm never going to do this again, where you just play something because you're supposed to, and it's just really bad. Uh, it, it's because... So you have to keep on practicing it until you figure it out. I would say that uh, it's possible to take older music in that way too. Mm -hmm. it, and, and, and that would be maybe, it, I call it norm critical interpretation, where you, where you try and figure out how much of the interpretation is just what you've heard on records and how much is actually in the piece from the beginning. And it's possible to do some sort of deep interpretation of older pieces too. I think that's sort of what I like doing. I'm going to play a bit um, from both uh, uh, the Four Seasons and Wagner Under, and maybe you then say a bit more about these two. Yeah, uh, Matthias is a, is a professor in, in composition in, in Stockholm, uh, electronic composition, 
And so what we did was we reported all of the parts of the original on my violin. We pitched down the, the, uh, the, the cello and bass parts. Uh, and so he had like this um, version with my violin of all of the parts. And then he, he sort of treated these as, as found objects and started doing stuff with them to make them like electroacoustic pieces. So there's 12 different sort of background electroacoustic pieces that he's written. Uh, then he sent them to me, and I had to take a few months to sort of... Uh, I never looked at the notes, I just tried to play the piece from memory, because we all know the, the piece. Uh, and I tried to uh, play things that would fit to those sounds that I got back from him. Uh, and Because if, if I played it normally, it would sound really stupid. So, so I decided to keep on working on each move until it, what I did didn't sound stupid. Uh, and, and then uh, after about three months, I went back to him and then we started rehearsing because he was doing live electronics and I go through his computer. Um, and, and, and so it took about six months, but after that we, we sort of had a, a, a thing we could do that, that felt organic and normal and felt sort of like the Four Seasons uh, maybe felt 300 years ago. That's what we do. And that's what we always do, basically. I get a piece, I get some electricity music, and I try and play until the violin sounds okay with those sounds. That's also a very good definition for composition. You work on something that doesn't sound stupid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, maybe I should also play um, the recomposition of Bach Chacona. Since we are, uh, and maybe you can tell us about that Japanese composer who uh, okay, yeah. took Bach and did something with it. I went to play it first. Yeah, you, you find all these things that I have no idea on the internet. Uh, like this, this video, I, I, I mean, this is like five years ago. And anyway. <laughs> So we won't, I mean, you know, come on. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, that just sort of keeps on going and going. Uh, the, the funny thing about this was, uh, so this is Naoshi Kukiyama, who's a friend of a friend, I guess you could say. Uh, 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 Yuriko Kojima is a professor at Shobi University in Tokyo, and she's written pieces for me a few times, and uh, so she got this project together with one of her colleagues, and this is uh, Kukiyama-san. He's very good at putting out great pictures of 
buffooned on Facebook. <laughs> he, he, he's, and and he, he's also a very good pianist. Uh, and he does a lot of electronic uh, things together with his wife, who's a video artist. So this was, he loves the Chacon, and he made this uh, sort of background, very Japanese uh, background electronics that, you know, small bleeps that, that come. And he's basically just uh, adding on, like you started hearing there. It gets more and more and more and more and more, and then it goes back to the beginning. Uh, but the weird thing about it is this, you know, he just, this wasn't, so much a collaboration is that he was sort of inspired by the fact that I did this older stuff, so he just wrote a piece for me. But the, but the weird thing is that, we, and this is always a, a, a scary thing for a violinist, the first 30 seconds, the, the, um, the uh, blips in the background are in time, but after that, you, they're not supposed to be anymore, and so it feels like you're doing something wrong all the time. Uh, but, but, uh, but it's basically, it starts off like that, then it starts with, just becoming these blips in their own world while the violin is still playing this sort of, uh, I guess he, he was trying to make it sort of flow. Uh, but that's that piece, yeah. Another way of using Bach, I guess. Um, so uh, before playing a, a fragment from Bach Under, I'd like to ask you a bit about the form, uh, because it's, uh, it's a whole uh, map of things going on there. And also, why you chose this instrumentation? Because it's a, it's a very non-traditional instrumentation for this piece. Karma. <laughs> <laughs> I. It was a, a commission of, of uh, Alborg Symphony Orchestra, so they wanted to, for me to. Uh, Compose a concerto for this weird uh, ensemble, which is uh, uh, oboe, uh, French horn, uh, trombone, and viola. Mm. Yes, and uh, so they were the soloists, and I said, "Oh my God, what I'm doing with this?" <laughs> but um, I, I had a an obsession on Wagner. Um, and uh, I said, okay, let's imagine something. These guys are from the orchestra, and these are uh, uh, the family of Albert, the Nibelung. So they are coming from the orchestra, and <laughs> they are masked guys, and uh, they will have a chat <laughs> there <laughs> together in the Nibelheim, you know? And how, how can I manage this? So I imagine uh, from the Rheingold, I took the beginning, which is uh, the moment when uh, Wotan goes to the Nibelheim. So this is my beginning. So these guys are teleported in Nibelheim, for instance, from the orchestra there. And they managed to um, have a chat like this, and uh, in pairs, and after that, uh, they will have a, a cadenza, they will spread out in the concert hall, and uh, <clears throat> then they are coming back on the stage after the cadenza, and uh, they simply don't stand anymore each other. <laughs> so they leave. The French horn leaves and joins the French horn uh, <laughs> section. <laughs> then uh, the second who is leaving is the oboe, then, no, the, the trombone, and uh, they are very angry people, and the viola player remains and screams, of course, and then goes to, like, uh, uh, a procession then, then begins, and as a matter of fact, uh, there are seven uh, seven sections of this uh, story, and it ends uh, with a, a section which I call the Necropolis, because under Wagner is Auschwitz. You know, so that's why Wagner under, and. Uh, it, uh, it has done a good impression in, in the 
first performance in Aalborg, then it would put, uh, was performed here in Athenaeum also, as you know. This is a story. I, I try to imagine some story because a concerto, it's a concerto for the soloist or soloists. So you have to think uh, in terms of theater, in terms of uh, film, and in terms of action. Yes. And also, uh, like we talked about how to make a, a cool, friendly environment for new music, but also what you're doing is you're creating in your own music a cool and friendly environment for the listener. With uh, Maybe you can uh, talk us, uh, tell us a bit about uh, this, um, also the Pome style, uh, also the, this work with images and uh, very uh, creating a... a, a, a the script. The script. The script. Yes. Uh, imaginary script yes. for each piece. Yes. Yes, I try to do this also uh, writing down. The, 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 the process is like this. I, I, I begin with an anchor. So I don't know nothing about the new piece that will come. So then I say I will throw an anchor in the unknown domain. Something crazy, something, an obsession, something, just in order to be there. And then I'm trying to elaborate a, a musical material uh, in order to go to that anchor. And on the way, it seems that other materials are coming out, other ideas are coming. So maybe I use that anchor. I, 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 I forgot of it. And I go in another direction. Yes, I cut it. So, uh, but it helps me in order to put the thoughts in, in order. Uh, and then, after uh, this, I, I have some sketches uh, with, uh, I, I, with volumes. I think in volumes, in registers, and uh, this kind of uh, uh, architectonic uh, ways. So in order to have all the, the, the landscape of the piece, and then I try to find a narrative, a story of this. And, uh, uh, you know, to, to put uh, the, uh, the soloist in some context and some symbolic gestures, then uh, it, it brings a lot of uh, musical sense. And, uh, of course, there, is an, uh, there are many these magic gestures in the normal concerto uh, concerti uh, repertoire. You know, if you uh, hear the Greek concerto, the beginning, or the Brahms violin concerto, the second movement, there are some really uh, magical moments. Uh, not only in the music, but in the relationship between the soloist and the orchestra. And this is, this gives us some uh, 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 how do you say, open mark? <laughs> impulses. Yes, impulses. What was the word? There is no, I don't know in English, this kind of word of combination of syllables. So, Diana Moshu, you played a lot of that in this music. Uh, from a performer point of view, um, does knowing this uh, story or map before you play the piece uh, help or uh, you prefer to create your own story and then uh, discover what the composer actually uh, had in mind? You know, I think the score has its own story. So I think uh, I have to start with the score. and. Uh, Upon the score, you create, of course, your uh, script, your personal script. 
And after that, you compare with the script that the composer uh, tell you, and uh, it's sort of combination. But firstly, it's the score, I think. Yeah, I mean, the composer can be wrong. Yes. <laughs> yes, of it's course. It's for sure. That's the whole thing. Yeah, well, it's perhaps, too subjective. <laughs> and perhaps someone will come with a better idea. I don't yeah, know. Or, so, or at least something that makes the composer say, yeah, that's actually what I wanted. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's, it's, uh, but the score it's not that... has its own life. And uh, when uh, the process of creation is uh, finished, I think uh, every work has uh, his potential, his life. Uh, well, uh, yeah. I think so. Yeah, absolutely. And even historical music. <laughs> um, I will play now a fragment for Wagner and other. Uh, 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 uh,
recording is on YouTube, so if anybody didn't see the piece, you have it uh, there to watch. Um, I'm going to jump to something very different. Um, speaking of uh, this idea of a modern performer, and what a modern performer should be, and what uh, a musician now should uh, think and do. Um, maybe you can tell us a bit about this and also about why you, uh, you are so in love with the electronic part and how uh, does this work, this magic uh, mixture of uh, instruments, uh, uh, traditional, the very traditional sound of violin and uh, all the electronic input. That, and how, how very modern sounds. So, uh, so when I hear someone uh, like Matthias was a good example, we played together uh, at, a, at a concert with something totally different and I, I heard the way he made his electronic sounds and I said, this is the guy to do the Four Seasons with him because it was just the perfect kind of uh, feeling to, to his sounds. Uh, and every different electronic composer has a different kind of, of um, feeling and if I like that, like. Annie Gosfield tends to like to sample very analog sort of uh, things. And, and the way she writes her solo violin pieces, she's written three pieces for me, and each time she has these uh, samples of, um, just an example, she has samples of, say, shortwave radios or satellites that, that she's recorded. So you hear this, and then she says, okay, how can you make this sound like that on the violin? And so I'm in her apartment, and I try to make these things sound like that. And then after a while she goes, exactly like that, how do I write that? And then she writes down the, the, the playing style or how, how, to do, how to make that sound. Um, and, and that's always been interesting to me. Because uh, the violin can sound in a lot of different ways and, and because uh, the, 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 the dominant way of making a violin sound is, is very, very important to, to be able to play in the romantic style because that's the way to get the maximum tone and it's a way to get, you know, to show people that you know how to play. But uh, there are so many other ways that are at least as interesting to play on a violin. And so I think that's why I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in working together with electronics or with tapes because then it's easier for me to sort of get something to to, to make the violin sound like, uh, then, it, then it becomes more organic. Because it's possible to have violin and electronics and it's extremely boring because one of them has headphones on and you know, you know the violin sounds like the violin and the electronics sounds like the electronics. And that's no fun. So, so I think that's why I got interested in electronics. And also, uh, you um, brought with you a sample of music that I uh, would like to play. Maybe you can uh, tell the, the about the Yes. Uh, the, the one, okay. Uh, okay, so this is a really strange concept. Uh, it's two artists who live in Berlin. They're from, um, they're from uh, uh, Odense, uh, close to, close to Old Boy. Uh, and they, they've been working for 15 years by just having these, uh, using vinyl records and cutting them up and playing them. Uh, a couple of years ago they started shooting holes in records uh, and then playing them again. And, and, and she, in order to do that, uh, Greta, one of, one of the two uh, girls in the, in, the, in the duo, had to learn how to shoot. She hates guns, but she had to like, you know, take lessons for six weeks to learn how to shoot so that she could shoot records properly. Uh, and what they do is that they reattach uh, these sounds and then they send them to me, and then I have to orchestrate them so that musicians can sound like these shot-up records. Uh, and it's a, a really, really interesting project because um, because the, the mere idea of playing, let's say, a Beethoven violin sonata, but it keeps skipping, uh, and, and it creates a whole new logic that our brains sort of uh, turn into a new piece. And it also sort of heightens your... your, your um, your idea of the structures behind these classical masterpieces and how they how they ended up. 
this was the first project they did with me where they cut a vinyl record in two, and then they cut another vinyl record in two, and then they glued, glued them together. And one of them, I think there's a photo there, maybe. Of, uh, I don't know why it's not working. Oh, it's not working, okay. Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, so, so what they did, they sent me a vinyl record. Ah. So you see, the half of it is, is Beethoven's Violin Concerto with Oysterak, and half of it is actually is a Romanian folk music with this... Uh, oh, I, I, I wish I could see his name. But he's a very well-known uh, Romanian violinist. Uh, and so they cut it in half, and then they made a two-minute piece, because it, it skipped every time it went you know, to the... To the uh, and then they sent it to me, and then I had to play it. And then they made a vinyl recording of my playing, and then they had an installation with the original cut record over there and then my violin uh, on another record playing at the same time on the other side of the room. Uh, and it's just really, really interesting. If you hear the original, I, I, I would, it, it's only two minutes, so we could start by doing one minute of the original just to see what, what I got from these people and, and uh, how we had to solve this it. This is original. Yeah, not the lie, the original. Yeah, we're going to Romania too. 
uh, they were in Temeswara two days ago. Right? Yeah, maybe this is it. So long. Yeah, I think so. Uh, so they do live stuff with records, but they also start writing this sort of stuff. And this is this I think is a really fun project. We've been doing it for a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. So okay, so uh, another way of uh, using pre-existing yeah. material. Yeah. Um, and you do, uh, I think, something similar with uh, forms. Uh, you, uh, let's say you update traditional forms. And um, I, I, I'm going to play a, a bit from uh, the uh, violin um, cycle. Cycle, uh, bestiary. Yes, but the mythological bestiary. Yes, yes bestiary. Um, yes. And uh, there, uh, the fragment that I. Uh, I've chosen is the Mandragora, where uh, you use um, bit, uh, uh, the Pasacalia form, but in a kind of a roller coast, coaster way. Um, maybe you can tell us a bit about, um, also, like for a composition student, why it's important to have this knowledge of the traditional forms, and uh, how can they uh, update them, since we're talking about updating pre-existing things. Yes, just in order not, not to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> just, uh, you have to deal with. Uh, there are some uh, forms which are normal in the music. In music, because the perception is done like this, which you, you cannot otherwise. Uh, deal with them. Uh, it's our perception of that it's uh, molded on them. So you have to know just in order to spare time and to bring these forms to for I mean to the fore in order to show your own feeling emotions, uh, thinking, and so on. So it is very important. And I wanted to uh, um, observe something. This kind of uh, performance, like uh, uh, George, uh, they are also researchers, they are thinkers, uh, they prolong their, uh, let's say, performance in the environment of thinking about music, uh, researching about music. Some of them are dealing with other instruments. Some of them deal are dealing with electronics as a prolonging tool for uh, uh, expressing their uh, thoughts. And uh, I think uh, these uh, prolongations uh, are uh, typically for our time. And uh, of course, in, uh, there were also magnificent performers who used to play violin, uh, piano, or conducting, and so on, like Enesco used to, to be. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, nowadays, I observe this trend for uh, performers which are involved in research, uh, thinking about their own perspectives, uh, their own playing, and uh, researching uh, new ways of uh, being, not only in the new music, but also in uh, old music, for instance, ancient music, but also in the normal concert uh, way of uh, uh, playing Beethoven or Brahms in another way, or assuming some other postures. Yeah. I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it tells us a lot about this administrational distinction between performer and composer and uh, conductor and researcher and musicologist. Yeah. So uh, they are, yeah, they yeah. are, yeah. yes, all of them, they are uh, the in the same musicianship, uh, assume that. And that's that's what's going to help us in the future because we have to do it ourselves, and, and it's it's a it's a it's not a bad development. I think it's a yes. good development that we're all in the same sort of situation. I was just going to say really quickly before we hear the piece, if you want, I mean, form musical form is the best way to 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 make the to make an audience friendly atmosphere. That's that's why we have form, you know, because without form the the audience is lost. 
Yes, that's a good reason and form, of course. <laughs> no, you are right. It's the form is the intelligibility of perception. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's very simple. Yeah. If you don't have any form, so you don't know what are, how to put the material. Then you are not. No, you don't yes. have music. Yes. But yes. music is organizational. Yeah. In time. Yes. 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 Sound. So form is <laughs> a good thing. But work on form. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, before uh, I will play the piece. The piece is played by uh, Valentina Deviu, who is uh, also speaking of uh, no borders. He said that he's also a very good pianist, and his wife is a musicologist who is also a very good pianist. Mm. And by uh, Diana Mosh, I wanted to quickly ask Diana Mosh, um, how did your collaboration with Van Deviu start? Because you have worked a lot with him. I think I time. was... Uh, a student when we start. Uh, oh, she, I know. She was my student in four. Yes. <laughs> four <laughs> yes. It, uh, but uh, yes. but it, it was not like that. Uh, my best friend and colleague uh, was Irina Mureșanu. And uh, she needs someone for the second violin for a quartet uh, composed by, by that day. Oh, yes. And uh, so we start the collaboration. And after that, Irina uh, left went, the yes, yes, left the country, and uh, we continued to collaborate uh, for uh, well uh, many projects. Okay. And uh, in uh, 2003 or 2004, uh, profile project yes. uh, started, and uh, since then until now, we could. It continues, so uh, it's like that. Uh, yes. If I uh, well remember. But or... not only for, for my music, Diana, it's uh, uh, the core of the ensemble, let's say it like this, uh, also for other musics. And you all know that uh, we are building the profile, uh, ensemble profile uh, with uh, a lot of uh, young people and also, also uh, Profiled composers, we, we play a lot of uh, music and the secret is to be involved because they are 100% involved and myself too, even they are not playing my music. I, I'm hearing them and they ask me how it looks uh, here yes. and there. You it's can, a very precious collaboration. Uh, for, very, insta very precious. for instance, if we have a piece which doesn't reveal from the first time or from the score, what we have to do something in order for this piece in order to come to the fore and then i'm coming with my ideas diana with the uh, uh, ideas uh Tiberio Suarez, our conductor is coming with other uh, perspective and we are doing for the piece the piece is the best we can yes. some pieces are of course good some pieces are less but, but to get what's the best in a piece, yes. we try. We, we have to the time. emphasize the, the every piece in their own way. And speaking of normality, uh, about the, the import of, uh, involving of an institution in this phenomenon, I think the the things uh, really happened uh, not with an intervention by up to down. But uh, in real life, so uh, I collaborate uh, with uh, Dan as well as a composer, but as my uh, advisor, advisor, advisor for uh, anything else, or with uh, Valentina, not as uh, a musicologist, but uh, as pianist as well, or uh, with uh, Dino Chocan, uh, uh, which uh, who makes uh, brilliant lessons about semiotics, but uh, with applicability. Uh, so uh, all things really happen. Or at uh, uh, chamber music, I had uh, as professor Nicolae Brundusch, who is uh, also a composer. So all the things are related. And uh, everything yes. is connected, like everything is connected. Or Mihai Manichanu as a composer, but as a pianist also. So it's a, a sort of organic uh, um, environment. Environment, yes. 
this is what I always say to you, if, if younger, if students ask me, you know, or composers especially say, how, how do I get started, you know, how do I get that, and, and it's always the same, it's work with your friends. Mm -hmm. Write for your friends, they'll play it, I promise, you know, because they're friends, and that's how you start. You can't start by, by looking, finding some people who don't know you, yes. and saying, please, play my music, because, you know, they're not going to do that, you know, so you have to, you have to, you have to start by just making it organic and, and doing things in your own circle, and then they'll get bigger and bigger, the circles. Let's hear Mangra Goral, and then... Uh, it's uh, completely in 
a uh, different way, uh, you know, more easy, more... Uh, so I think uh, we have to be more open than the traditional way, uh, you know, and to start all the time uh, from historical, uh, historical uh, file. I, I think it's not necessary. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, better to combine, uh, to skip from uh, uh, a time to another, so uh, like, like uh, a play, like a... Do you think this can apply to composition as well? Um, I think uh, education needs uh, commitment. And uh, you have to be very committed about the subject in order to convince the other people. You have to explain very wisely and to know how to explain uh, and that means that you have to know the music you explain. Um, so to emphasize the good points, uh, uh, the strong the strengths, yes. And uh, then to discover the music within the new music. And, and the accent, in my opinion, has to be on music, not on new. So this is also new music with an accent on new, which is not music. But there is new music with the accent on music, so you have to reveal for the student the music within new music, you know? So, and that applies to all professions. I mean, uh, in, in music, also for composers. It's a, a, a couple of years ago, or three years ago, we had a project at, at our festival of Stockholm where uh, we had uh, uh, 12 composers wrote uh, very short pieces for uh, uh, 10 or 11 year olds who were going to, to music school. Uh, it was percussion and guitar were the two different groups and, and luckily we had two good teachers at the school. They said, yeah, we'll, we'll work with them for some months and they'll play the piece. Uh, and, and uh, tying into what you said, the, these musicians uh, became much better afterwards because, because I think in, in, in our sort of classical world, uh, you learn as you're growing up to think in terms of right and wrong. And, and, and when you were playing the new music, the kids were actually listening to the sounds they were making. And that's, a, the, that's the most important thing you can do. If you're learning an instrument, to actually start listening to what, what you're producing as sounds instead of thinking about, well, this is straight now, and you know, and I'm doing this correctly, and 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 it was so nice seeing these kids realize that they were just making sounds and they weren't worried about being correct. They were, but they were being correct, but they weren't worried about it. They were just playing music, and that's one of the good ways of getting, you know, if you can get people to write for younger people and get a good teacher when they're a little younger, then they become much much better musicians because they start thinking about playing music. Yes, and nowadays I think it's very important for uh, a uh, performer to uh, to adapt, to adapt in each moment. So adaptability is uh, one of the most uh, qualities for an artist today. moment I am going to ask if someone from the audience wants to ask a question or to say something or to add something. Since our time, I think it's almost up. I'm, I'm just going to close with music, and I'm, you know, if George lets me, I'm going to close with the Odd Boy and an Old Dog. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's a, a, an amazing uh, project uh, with cartoons created especially for the Thugs Before Spine experience. And... Uh, he was a great, he was a, he was a really great composer. Uh, unfortunately, he, he, he passed away a year and a half ago, and he was only 40 years old. 
but until then, he did a lot of really great, great, great pieces, uh, both for just film and also for film musicians. Uh, and he, he wrote the animations himself and he wrote the music himself. And the good thing about it was that he did it at the same time. So he didn't really, it's not like he put music to film or film to music. He just sort of, yeah, now I'll do this a little bit. And he, and he had these um, notebooks with dots, you know, so he could either make notes or make small figures. And uh, it's such a fascinating process doing the, the story and the, uh, the uh, music at the same time.
very much to all three of you for uh, coming here <laughs> this early time and uh, uh, being with us and we all invite you to have uh, a bit of uh, morning snacks. <laughs> Cookies. <laughs>